Hello, in this lecture I will be covering work, kinetic energy, potential energy, and the conservation of mechanical energy. I will begin with the concept of work. Uh, when we say work, in its simplest definition, it's basically, it is the product of the force times distance. Probably you've seen it in your um, previous physics classes, maybe in high school. For example, let's say I have a box uh, sitting on the floor or a surface of a table or whatever. Here's the box. And it is, let's say, at some position, let's call it X, uh, let's say X1, okay? And what I want to do is I push the box. Here is the push, the force, or maybe I pull it. I push the box until the box now is located at uh, a, a, a new position. Let's say it is um, x sub 2 right here. So the distance here, which is delta x or x2 minus, minus x1, let's just call that distance d. So what I say is that uh, we have done work, so uh, um, we have done work to move the box from position x1 to x2. Another way of saying it is that there was a work done by the force from x1 to x sub 2. You see what I'm saying? So, it is the force that does the work, you get that? Which is basically my hand pushing on the on the box, that would be the force. So work is done always by a force. That's one definition, that's one simple definition. We're gonna talk more about it in a, in, in a minute. Um, now, if the force is a variable, or in, in the most general case for work, it's actually it's the integral of f dx from x1 to x2. What that means is that, uh, let's say, for example, uh, let's say the force here is a function of position, okay? So here is the function of position. Let's assume it is symbolized with this function here, some arbitrary function. I'm going to call it f of x, big f of x here. Okay, and so the integral from, say, x1 to x2 here, so the integral from x1 to x2 of the function, I keep writing it small, f of x dx, which is basically what? The area under the curve here, right? This area right here. And this area under the curve is what we refer to it as work. Okay? So that's another way of defining it. And we use the integral only when the force here is not a constant. You see what I'm saying? If it's a constant, you can simply just use this force right here. A force times distance. Because the force is a constant. Let's say you're pushing the box with, uh, say, uh, 50 Newton. So it's a constant number. So you simply just multiply by the distance. But if, if the force is a variable, okay, uh, in this case, uh, you have to integrate it. So it is the integral, or the area under the curve, rather, is what we define as the work. Okay. Later on, we're going to study that, another definition for work, and that is, which is, it's the transfer of energy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So that's basically what work is. Um, let me give you an example. I'll show you what that means. So again, I'm going to go back to this uh, the box. Oops, I think I reached the edge of the tablet. Let me move it to the side. There we go. So suppose, for example, that I have this box right here and it's sitting on the surface, and let's say I pull it with a force equals say 50 newton for a distance of let's say now the box is here 
let's say this is uh, x equals zero, and then this one x equals 10 meters, for example. I'm just making things very simple. All right, so what is the work done in this case? So the work done is f equals, um, f equal, uh, excuse me, uh, w equals f sub times distance, d or x, whatever you want to call it. And since the force is a constant, I can use, use simply this formula. So it becomes 50 Newton times the distance, which is obviously 10 meters. So I will get uh, 500 <clears throat> Newton meter. Is that right? So that's basically what the work is. Now, the unit Newton meter, we refer to this as the joule, which is a unit of energy. So Newton meter, in a box here, it says, we call that the joule. Okay, and the symbol of it is big J, big letter J. Okay, and it's a unit of energy. Later on, we'll learn that the work is a form of energy. So, unit of energy. Okay. So, basically, we have exerted a work or the, 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 the force that was done on the box. Uh, sorry, the work that was done on the box by the force is equal to 500 joule. Got it? Okay. Uh, one more example. Now, suppose I'm going to have exactly the same example as above, except that the force this time now, it's, uh, you know, let's say it has an angle. So it's not exactly uh, along the x-axis, but it is at some angle. So again, we have the box here. And now I am pulling on the box like this. This is the force. Suppose this is the angle. Uh, let's say 30 degrees, for example. Okay. And everything else the same. So I move it. I want to move the box all the way to, uh, you know, say by 10 meters. So this is 10 meters here. And this is we're starting from zero meter. Okay. So what is the work is equal to here? Here is the thing. We said that, let me just go back. So we said that this is X, right? Or distance D, whatever you want to call it. Okay. The condition for work for work is that the force must be parallel with the displacement as vectors. See what I'm saying? In other words, this force right here, let me put a vector on it. Um, it's not parallel to the displacement. The displacement is along the x-axis right here. Obviously, this is not parallel to it, okay? However, the one that will do the work, okay, the force that will do the work is the component of this force that is parallel to the displacement. The other component is not going to do any work, okay? So, if I would resolve this vector into two components, so I'm going to have one component like that, which is F cosine 30. And then I have another component like that, which is F sine 30. And notice that the, the work, uh, excuse me, the, the, the force along the x-axis, which is F cosine 30, is parallel to the displacement. And therefore, this is the one that will do the work. You get that? So in this case, the work is fx, but again, it is really f cosine 30 times x, which is 10, okay? Again, we said that, suppose that the force is, uh, say, 50 Newton, just like in the previous problem. So it's going to be 50 multiplied by cosine 30, which is 0.866 times 10. And then we can calculate the work in this case. Let's use my calculator here. Um, I'm creating those numbers on the fly. So 50 times 0.866 times 10. And that gives me 433 joule. Okay, there we go. But this is very important. Keep in mind that the force and the displacement must be parallel. Must. Okay? Good. All right. Um... Okay, let me cover the concept of kinetic energy. 
and I'll give you some examples on it. Then I will come back to the concept of work and show you how the two are related, kinetic and work. So let's do that. Kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, think of it like motion energy, okay? So if an object is moving, regardless whether or not moving at constant speed or not, whether it is accelerating or decelerating, it doesn't matter. As long as it's moving, as long as it has a certain speed, it has a certain kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy, uh, it has the symbol big K, is equal to one half m v squared. M here being, <coughs> excuse me, the, the 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 mass of the object, and v here is the velocity. <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Let me derive this formula very quickly for you. It actually comes out from f equals m a. There are several ways of deriving it, but here is one. So we know that f equals m a, and uh, and we know that a is d v d t right? It's the, the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And we know, the we know that also that the velocity uh, can be a function of position. Let's say, let's call that position um, x and time, okay? So I can use the chain rule here, watch. So I have here f equals ma or f equals m dv dt. And I just said that the V here is a function of position and time. So I can say that, I can use chain rule from calculus. That would be dV dx dx dt. See what, I did? See what I've done? And then I know that dx dt is V, right? By itself. Remember? V is dx dt. So therefore I can have M, this one, right here is v i'm gonna put it here times dv dx okay and then i have here f now um if i would take this dx right here and put it to the other side so i'm gonna end up with f dx equals m v dv okay now if i integrate both sides Okay, before I do the right hand side, look at the left hand side. Does this look familiar to you? I have just defined it for you right there. Right here. Remember the uh, the work under the curve right here, under the curve, the area under the curve is equal to from x1 to x2, f d, fx dx equal to the work. So that's nothing but the work. So we can just say that this is work right here. And then we have the integral of, uh, you know, uh, let me just put in here from x1 to x2. So that means this one from v1 to v2. So this gives me, if I would integrate it, well, before I integrate it, let me just take them m out here. So I have here v1, v2, v dv, integrate that. And that'll give me what? One half m v two squared minus one half m v one squared. So we come up with something really interesting, and that is the work is equal to one half m v two squared minus one half m v one squared. Now we just said that one half m v squared is right here is the kinetic energy. So basically the work, in addition to the fact that it is equal to fx right there, the very first formula that we started with right here, work is equal to force times distance or the integral of f dx, it's also equal the difference between two kinetic energies, okay? So basically work is equal to, if we said that the kinetic energy is k, so that would be k2 minus k1, right? So we can say that work is delta k. And this is very important formula. It's called the, where, the work energy theorem or the work kinetic energy theorem.
the work kinetic energy theorem. Okay. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you a very simple example. Suppose that I'm riding my bicycle, okay? And as I ride my bicycle, I'm going with a speed of, let's say, that's my initial speed, say, um, let's say 10, uh, let's say eight miles an hour. Okay, let's just use miles an hour, which is the typical speed of a, of a bicycle, I guess, a regular bike. Okay, eight miles an hour. Let's say now I would like to go a little bit faster. So I push on the pedal and I exert some work. I mean, work here, you can think of it like exertion, energy exertion. So I exert some work and I keep pushing on the pedal, pushing harder and harder until I obtain a velocity, a new velocity of, say, um, say 12 miles an hour. Okay. So what I have done here is that I have done work. Okay. I have done work on the bicycle. That work is equal to the difference between the kinetic energy, the final kinetic energy, minus the initial kinetic energy. For example, let me just, if I convert this to meters per second, let's suppose this is six meters per second, roughly. And let's say this one is about, uh, let's say four meters per second. Okay. And let's assume that my mass with the bicycle total, let's say, um, let's say 150, oh, that's too heavy. Let's say, uh, let's make it 100, 100 uh, kilograms, for example, okay? So how much work have I done to go from 8 miles an hour, which is 4 meters per second, to 12 miles an hour, which is about 6 meters per second? How much work have I done? Well, according to the work energy theorem, it's delta K. It's this one, the difference between the two kinetic energies. So let's do that. So I have here 1 half mv2 squared minus, oops, sorry. Minus uh, one half m v one squared. So before I put in my numbers, let me just do uh, simplify it. So I have here one half m v two squared minus v one squared, and that'll give me one half times m is one hundred kilogram, times v two squared, which is thirty six minus v one squared is sixteen. So that's uh, one half times. Uh, oops, sorry. That's 100 times uh, 30, uh, that'll be at 20. So that will be uh, 10, 1,000 joule. There we go. If I did it right. So here we have, I have exerted an amount of 1,000 joules on my, you know, on the pedal uh, to go from 8 miles an hour to 12 miles an hour. Okay, that's the meaning of it. Okay, this is very important formula, guys. Make sure you understand it. It's called the work energy theorem. We're going to come back to it and develop another relationship for potential energy, okay, later on. But for now, uh, we have dealt with three types of uh, formulations for calculating work. Here they are. Let me just review them very quickly before we go any further. We said if the, f if, if the work, excuse me, if the force is very, is a constant, simple, then work is equal to F times distance, okay, when f is constant does not change right and then we also said f is equal to the integral from some value x1 to x2 of f of x dx okay that's the second formula that calculates work and the third one is the work energy theorem w equals delta k the kinetic energy okay Later on, we'll have work equal delta PE, the potential energy. We'll come back to it later in the lecture. Okay? All right. Let's do some problems. Uh, let me go back to the book. I want to do example 9.8. Uh, let me show you the example. Here it is right here. He said, pull until it slips. Okay, so we have a toy train, as you can see. This is a toy train. And then we have <coughs> um, a spring and a mass of two kilograms. Let's read the problem. 
He says the, the figure shows a spring attached to a two kilogram block. The other end of the spring is pulled by a motorized toy train that moves forward at a speed of five centimeter per second, not meter, that would be really fast, five centimeter per second. Okay, the spring constant, which is the, stif the stiffness, is 50 meters, excuse me, 50 newton per meter, and the coefficient of friction between the block and the surface right here is 0.6, all right? The spring is, is at its equilibrium length at t equals zero, so that's the beginning, okay? When the train starts to move, when does the block slip, okay? So what that means is the following. Think of it this way. Let me make it magnify it. All right. I want to kind of pause the video and think about it, but here is my explanation to it. So imagine the train will begin to move. As it is moving, it is stretching the spring, correct? And the block is not moving yet. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because it's resisting friction. So let me repeat. The spring, the, the, the train is moving. The spring spring is being stretched and for the next uh, who knows few seconds maybe the block is not budging at all it's not moving eventually eventually the force on the spring is going to take over and it's going to move the block got it the question is he's asking the question let's go back so with this in mind he said when does the block move slip as the so we have to calculate something like you get the spring stretching at a certain point it will begin to move okay so let me draw a free body diagram of all of that i can put it in there on the side so you can see the picture that'll be great there it is okay so here's a picture how it looks like something like this I like to draw a picture to kind of uh, help me solve it, not just a free body diagram. So here is like the chimney of the train, and there are the wheels. I mean, you don't need to draw it kind of pretty, you know, there's no need for that, but anyway. And then we have the spring here. And then we got the, the block. Here's the floor, right? Here's the block right here. Two kilogram. And the, 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 the train is moving with velocity of five centimeters per second. Be careful, you want to convert this to meter per second. And then we have the stiffness constant K here, right? Okay. And he said, <clears throat> let's write what's given. So K is 50 Newton per meter. I'm looking at my book. I have the same problem right there. Um, the mass of the block is 2 kilograms. The velocity of the train is 0 0.05 meters per second. I have just converted it to, from centimeters. And the coefficient of friction here, right here between the block and the surface, is mu equals 0 0.6 not not terribly this is not terribly rough but it's not terribly smooth either anyway so we have that so what's going on here well what is the condition what's the condition for the block to move there's the question okay so why are you thinking about that i'm going to draw the free body diagram which basically here is the block that i'm drawing which is the block of the two kilogram block right here okay and I'm going to ask the question, what are the forces on it? Well, we got the force from the spring. That's a Kx, correct? And then we have a friction force going this way. I mean, the reason the block is not initially moving is because the friction is taken over. You see what I'm saying? In other words, Kx here is weaker than the friction. But as the train is moving, Kx is getting stronger and stronger. Eventually, it's going to take over F. It's going to be stronger than F, and it's going to move the block. That's the condition. Make sense? I hope it makes sense. Here we have the mg of the block, and we have the normal. Whenever we have friction, always put the normal there. There we go. Okay? So the condition here 
or we can say that the block will slip only when f is sorry uh, kx is greater than f when it takes over okay so the minimum here is what is when f equals kx that's the minimum the minimum force okay so that's basically the the the, the formula that we're going to work with right here okay now going back to the free body diagram right here as you can see uh some of the forces in the y direction is zero right i mean in the y direction like that that will be zero and therefore this will give me n minus mg equals zero and then the normal is equal to mg nothing new here i already know that i guess right and so now uh well we, we can say that but the friction force is equal to mu n and that makes it mu mg because n is equal to mg right here right so that's the f right there and so i go back to my equation here so i have f which is mu mg equals kx and i want to solve for x what is he asking for uh sorry about that when does he's asking for time uh-huh he's asking for time okay so how do i do it well let's let me find the 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 what how much displacement the spring is going to displace until it begins to move why do i need that well i'll show you in a second i mean that's the only one if you look at this formula the only unknown is the x here so let me let me solve it solve for x so x is equal to mu mg over k plug it in so i'll plug in all the numbers 0.6 for mu the mass is two kilograms g is 9.8 all of that divided by 50. now i can calculate the displacement of the spring you see what i'm saying and if i do it i'll end up with uh 0.235 meters or 23.5 centimeter there we go that's the value of x what does that mean it means as let me go back to the train as the train is moving with this velocity the spring is going to stretch a distance of 23 centimeters 23 and a half centimeters until the block begins to move got it that's the meaning of it okay so if i know this distance and I know the velocity of expansion or a stretch is five, five centimeters per second. So how long? Well, and there is no acceleration here. So that will be easy, I hope. We know that X is equal to V times T. So the T here is X over V. So that will be, uh, shall we put it in centimeters since we have everything in centimeters? It doesn't matter. So we have 23.5 centimeter divided by the velocity five uh, cent, uh, centimeters per second and then we can calculate the time and the time would be equal to 4.7 seconds okay let me recap very quickly what that means so that's the final answer we don't have the problem all right so go back to the diagram so what happens all right the train begins to move at speed of five meters per second it moves and as it is moving it's stretching the spring the spring will stretch for a distance of 23.5 until the block begins to move because at that distance the uh, kx the spring force will take over the friction force which is pulling this way that's the reason of this diagram this force kx is actually um, you know uh, it's getting stronger and stronger uh, and then it will eventually take over f and it will begin to move so how long would all of that be uh, uh, how long it will take well it's that 4.7 seconds okay i hope this is clear okay good before i do the next example uh, i want to show you work that is done by spring okay
suppose I have, um, let's say this is a wall, this is a floor. Let's say I have a spring attached to it like that, okay? Suppose that the spring is relaxed, okay? Um, and then what I want to do, I want to apply a force F on it like this. And I want to stretch it all the way, say, up to here. So from here, from right here, let's say up to here. So I have stretched it from this distance, to, uh, excuse me, from this position right here, call it, uh, say, X1, to this position right here, we'll call it X2, okay? So now the spring is stretched like that. Right here, all right? So, of course, I have done work on it. The question is, what is the value of this work? Um, because the force here is a function of distance, displacement x, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, therefore the force here is not constant. I mean, the, uh, the more you exert on it, the more resistance you're going to get from the spring. So the work here is from x1 to x2 of f of x dx. And as you know, the force f of x or the, the, the spring force f is equal to kx. Uh, so, or rather minus kx, uh, because it's a restoring force. I want to pay attention to the, uh, to the signs here. So it is minus because that's a restoring force. It's always opposite the displacement, if you will. That's why it's always resisting. Whether you compress the spring or stretch it, the spring always resists your force. You see what I'm saying? And that resistance is called a restoring force. So it's all we put that minus sign in there. So anyway, so if I plug in this value right here, minus kx, into this here, so I'm going to get something like this. kx dx. Take the, <clears throat> take the minus k outside, uh, x1 to x2 of x dx, and then when I integrate this, I'm going to end up with something like that. Uh, one half, uh, sorry, minus one half kx2 squared my, plus one half k x one squared and there we go this is the value of the work that is done by the force okay generally speaking you know if you put it in simple term the work here is equal to one half k x squared okay generally speaking we also refer to this to this value as the potential energy we'll come back to it later potential energy if i can spell it <clears throat> of the spring. Okay. So keep that in mind, this formula here, or this one, for the, specifically for the spring, because we're using the force, the spring force right here, Kx. Okay. So let's do the second example, which is related to what I have just said. And that's example um, uh, 9.9. .9. Let's go back to the book <clears throat> and look at this example. <coughs> Excuse me. 9.9 .9 is coming. Got to be coming somewhere. There we go. This is uh, work done by springs. And there we go. So I have a spring. And then I, uh, is it compression or... Yeah, so you stretch it. Of course, the, the, uh, this is the direction, the restoring force is always opposite to what you're doing. So anyway, he goes on and he derived pretty much the same thing with different uh, notation. There we go. The work is equal to one half kx squared. Okay. He uses the symbol s rather than x. There we go. Uh, using energy principle on a spring. Okay. The example says the following. He says the, Pin cube machine, okay, was an ill-fated predecessor of the pinball machine. I hope you know what the pinball machine is. Uh, a 100 gram cube, but the the the, the uh, pin cube is basically think of the pinball machine, but it's not a, a spherical ball, but rather is a cube. Okay, that's that's the only difference. Uh, I've never heard of it except for this example. Anyway, it says a 100 
gram cube is launched by pulling a spring back 12 centimeters and releasing it. All right. Uh, the spring's constant is 65 newton per meter. What is the cube's launch speed as it leaves the spring? Assume that the surface is frictionless. All right. And he has an exam uh, a, a picture of how it looks like. So you have the, uh, <clears throat> we have the cube. The cube is compressed against the spring. The spring stiffness constant is 65 newton per meter. The mass of the cube is 0.1 kilogram, which is 100 gram. And, and then you let go. And then what will happen is that the, uh, uh, the, the cube is shot, uh, with a velocity of V1. Uh, he's asking for what? With what cube speed? Yeah. So he's asking for what is that velocity? You see what I'm saying? So how do we do something like that? All right. Again, I'm going to draw my version of the, this problem and in, in, in free, as a free body diagram. I'll put it. You can see it as well. So here's my, my drawing. <clears throat> so what I have, I have something like a, think of it like a wall. And then I have a, a floor here, if you will, or a surface. And here is the spring. And then I have the box, excuse me, the cube here. And it is at x equal zero. Let's just say it's zero right here. The stiffness constant of the spring is k. And, and then it is uh, being compressed, right? This is a compression right here. And then it is released, and and then here. Sorry, I'm trying to draw it. Uh, so it's going at the speed v here, <coughs> and over a distance of uh, twelve centimeters. Is that right? Oh, I think I made a mistake. The velocity should be, excuse me, the, the position here would be, uh, let's see, the best way to do it is to call that negative. I mean, if we say that this is right here, if we say this is x0, so that would be negative uh, 0.12 meter. I, I hope this is clear. Okay. I think he's doing it. Yeah, he's doing it the same way here. There we go. Okay. Um Okay, so what do we do? Uh, we know that the mass is uh, 100 gram, and x naught is 12 centimeter, which is compression. That's why it's compression. Um, and then v naught, the initial velocity here. Remember, this is uh, this is x naught right here. The initial velocity right here is also zero <clears throat> so he's asking for the velocity here given that the distance is zero okay so what you have in here let's go back to the work energy theorem i'm going to write it this way because here we have a combination of uh, uh, spring displacement right you know spring compression and then expansion and then you have velocity. So I'm going to appeal to the work energy, kinetic energy theorem, this one, the one we just covered, work kinetic energy. What does it say here? Well, work, by definition, for as far as the spring compression is concerned, is equal to what? Here is the formula right there, guys, right here. I'm going to write this one down right there, okay? I'm going to write this one down. And then... Um, so I'm going to have, um, let me just copy it, minus one half K2 and so on. So that's going to be minus one half K X2 squared plus one half K X1 squared equals to, what is the kinetic energy? Again, we go back to that formula, the work energy theorem. Well, I hope I'll find it quickly. Right here, right there. See it? Right here. Here's the work energy theorem right there. You can pause the video and look at it more carefully, but it's right here. Okay, this is would be V naught, not one, and this is V two, the one we're dealing with, or whatever uh, notation we're using. So here we have um, one half 
m v two squared. I'm just copying it from the above, from the above. M v one squared. Now for our case, okay, the the um, the x two really is this one, and the x one is right here, right initial, and the v two here is this one, and the v one is uh, is v naught here. I hope this is clear for you. Let me let me let me change the color, so you can see what I'm trying to say. So if I'm going to rewrite this in our notation, that's going to be something like one half k x <coughs> uh, x two. Uh, this is x squared, which is equal to zero, plus one half k x naught squared equals to one half m v squared minus one half m v naught squared. Now v naught is here. The V naught is here, but there is no V naught. V naught is zero, right? I mean, it's compressed and it's just sitting there, right? So this is zero, and this is zero. So I'm left with this, basically. You see what I'm saying? So it becomes one half. That's a plus here. Keep, okay. So one half k x naught squared equals one half m v two squared and i'm pretty much done all i need is just to plug in my numbers halves cancel out and the k is uh i forgot what it is uh, 0.65 right there so i have here 0.65 uh, i'm sorry 65 newton i'm absent-minded sorry 65 newton per meter times x1 which is 0.12 squared. I could put the minus sign because there's a minus sign, but it won't matter because I'm squaring it. You see what I'm saying? Equals to the mass is uh, 0.1 kilogram. And then you got V naught here, V, v squared rather. And then we just solve for V. Uh, so I have here, if I do it symbolically, it's going to look something like that. X naught square root of K over M. And then we cal we just calculate the numbers, and you'll end up with 3.1 meters per second. And there we go. We have the answer. Okay. I hope this is clear. And remember, just one more note here. The, the spring here is compressed. And here, the spring unstretched stretched stretched i hope i spell it right there we go okay okay great okay one more example uh 9.6 from the book that's section um section three i think we are in section three 9.6 Oops, section three. Nine point six. Example nine point six. Nine point four. Oh yeah. Okay, so what you have here, let's let's look at it very quickly. So you get this picture of a person uh, skiing down a hill. <coughs> um and then uh, we have the hill is inclined at, an, at 10 degrees and the distance traveled is 50 meters and so on. I forgot the statement. Let's read the statement and look at the picture. There's a picture right here. He says a 70 kilogram skier is gliding at 2 meters per second when he starts down a very slippery 50 meter long 10 degree slope. What is his speed at the bottom right here? So, okay, so given the speed here is two meters per second, that's about, uh, I don't know, far, four miles an hour. So just double it roughly. Uh, so what is the speed down there? Okay, so uh, how do we do it in terms of, we can use kinematics to do it, but we want to use the concept of work and energy. Okay, so what's, what's happening here is uh, there is work done by the skier to move himself faster, right? So he's starting with some kinetic energy right here, and then he has a new kinetic energy here, larger, right? The difference between the two is equal to what? To the work done by the skier. Make sense? And what is work is equal to? 
fx. x is given to me. f is what? What is that force that is doing that? That's the difficulty of this problem, okay? What is the nature of the force? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a minute. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, let me change the color. So what I have in here, here is an inclined plane. Something like that. And the skier, I'm just going to make him a block like that. I mean, remember, this is a free body diagram. And so I asked the question, what are the forces on the skier? Well, we got the mg of the, remember, we this is an inclined plane. So this is mg straight down. Sorry for the, I can't do it. Uh, it's always difficult for me to make a straight down. There we go. That's better. Anyway, mg right here. This is the angle theta. We'll come back to the data later. What do I have? I have also the normal. Remember, the normal is always perpendicular to the surface. And then we have, what else do we do? Um, he said frictionless surface. Did he say that? He said the fr um, uh, slippery, so very slippery. So I assume that that means it's a frictionless surface. Okay, so we are ignoring friction here. All right. So those are the only two forces that we can think of, <clears throat> unless you can think of something else. Um, so what I want to do, if you remember how to do inclined plane, again, let me change the color. So I want to resolve the work into two components, one component going this way, which is mg cosine theta. Go back to the chapter or the video or the book on how to do inclined plane. I think I solved that in details in one of the videos. And this is mg sine theta, like that. Now things become clear. Remember I told you the work is done is equal to what? Force times distance. And what is the condition for work? Is that the force is parallel to the displacement. Very important. Okay? So what is the direction of the displacement? This way. How do I know that? Well, here's a picture. 50, 50 meters right there from here to here, this blue vector. This blue vector right here, that's a displacement. So what? So the only force that is doing work is the one that is parallel to this displacement. Well, what is that force? Well, it is the mg uh, sine theta right here. See, it is parallel to it. So there is a force that is parallel to it this way, and that's the one that is doing the work. There's no other force. The normal is not doing work. The mg cosine theta is not doing work. The only one that is doing the work is the mg sine theta. So therefore, I can say that the work done so the work done here is equal to fx, if you will, where x here, he's calling it r, is uh, the 50 meters, and the F here is mg sine theta times 50 meters. That's the work. You got that? Uh, let me call it delta X for now. Let me just keep it symbolic. I'll put the numbers later. And there we go. That's the work. I mean, let me box this problem, uh, this equation, and I'll come back to it in a second. Now, remember, he's asking for, he says, uh, what is the speed? Aha, uh -huh. what is the speed? So, I mean, this is the work. Do I have everything? Pretty much, I can get a number out of that. He didn't ask me for work, but if he asked me, I know I can just get that number. But since, ask, since he asked for the speed, we know that also from the work energy theorem, that work is equal to delta Ke. The difference between the two kinetic energy. In other words, work is equal to, uh, let's uh, put it this way, the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. In simple terms, 
one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. He tells me that the initial kinetic energy is two centimeters. Excuse me, two meters per second. Here, see, seventy kilogram skier is gliding at two meters per second when he starts down. So that's a start. That's the initial. What is the speed at the bottom? That's the final. Okay, so I got this one, the initial. I know the mass. All I need is to get the final, equate this to this, because that's the work, and I'm done with the problem. I can just solve for V sub F. Did you see the plan? I hope you did. Good. All right, so now we're going to equate this quantity with this quantity. So I have here um, mg. Oops, I, again, I reached the uh, edge. How do I get rid of that thing? There we go. So I have mg sine theta times delta x equals to one half m v f squared minus one half m v i squared this is the formula that will solve a problem for us remember we are we are solving for v sub f right so the masses cancel out and we can solve for VF. I'm going to move this to the other side. So I'm going to have G sine theta minus delta X plus half VI squared equals half VF squared. Multiply both sides by 2. So I'm going to get 2 G sine theta times delta X plus vi squared equals vf squared. And then finally, the final expression before I put in my numbers, v sub, b, v sub f that is, is equal to square root of 2g sine theta times delta x plus vi squared. And then we plug in the numbers. You see what I'm saying? And I'm just going to give you the answer, and you work it out. I got 13 meters per second. How much did he get? Let me see. Yeah, he did it pretty much the same. 13, <clears throat> excuse me, 13 meters per second. There we go. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, let me take on problem number 16 at the end of the chapter. This one uh, requires a dot product. And before I talk about it, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about work and the dot product. Uh, we said that the work is equal to F times X or distance. And if, if the two are vectors, if the, remember the displacement is a vector, and the force, of course, is a vector. When those two are vectors, then it's a dot product between them. Okay, so when you take the dot product between the force and the displacement, uh, you will get the work. Okay, this is the formal definition of it in terms of vectors, not functions. All right. Now, if it's a function, it just uh, you know, or uh, well, that would be an integral of f of x dx. Okay, and if it's a constant number, so it's just f times d, where d is a number and f is a number. All of them will give you the value of work. You see what I'm saying? But uh, we're going to take up this form right here in the case where the, the vector, excuse me, the, the, the displacement is a vector and the, um, and the force is a vector. So then we take the dot product, okay? So just to remind you, of, uh, remind you of the dot product, for those of you, dot product. Please take the time to read about the dot product. It's not a difficult product at all. So basically, uh, if I have, let's say, um, a equals to uh, say 3i plus 4j minus k for example and b let's say equal to i plus j plus k okay so the dot product a dot b simply you uh, you take the product of um, well I'll, I'll come back. One, one second, one second. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Um, the, the, the rule says the following. I dot I is 1. J dot J is 1. 
k dot k is 1, okay? So if they are the equal, they are the same, then this is basically what you got. However, i dot j is 0, i dot k is 0, and j dot k is 0, okay? That's basically the rule of the graph product, okay? So with this in mind, so when I dot the two vectors together, I'm going to get something like this, 3i plus 4j minus k dotted with, big dot here, i plus j plus k, correct? So with those rules in mind right here, so in this case, I'm going to go 3i dot i, 3i dot j, 3i dot k, and then 4j dot i, 4j dot j, and then 4j dot k, and then k dot i, k dot j, and then k dot k. You see that? So in keeping, if they are different, you know, i and j and so on, the zero. So basically, all you need to do is really 3i dot i, 4j dot j, and minus k dot k, and the rest are zero. So we can actually do it very quickly, and the answer would be 3 plus 4 minus 1, and that'll be equal to 6, and there we go, okay? You can pause the video and convince yourself that you get the right answer, okay? Simple. That's basically what the dot product is. Another tip about the dot product, if I have two vectors, A and B, and I take the dot product and I get an answer of zero, that means the two vectors, A and B, are parallel to each other, excuse me, they're per 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 perpendicular to each other. So if the dot product A and B is zero, then A is perpendicular to B. In other words, they look like this. Here is A, and here is say B like that. There's a 90 degree angle between them. So if I have two vectors and I am asking you, show that the two vectors are perpendicular. So what do you do? Take the dot product. If you get zero, they are perpendicular, indeed. Okay? And the reason for that is because the formal definition of a dot product, again, you can always go back to your calculus book to see all of this stuff. A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine the angle between them. That's the formal definition of the dot product. Well, if it's 90 degrees, then it's going to be cosine 90 here, and cosine 90 is 0, okay? More on this formula as we work with work, I'm going to show you how useful this formula is. So this formula is useful, sorry, okay, let's take up example number 16, I'll show you how to use how to solve it using the dot product okay so number 16 says go back to the book here it is 16 right there he says a 25 kilogram <coughs> excuse me air compressor is dragged up a rough incline from r1 equal 1.3 i plus 1.3 j meters to r2 8.3i plus 2.9j meters, where the y-axis is vertical. How much work does gravity do on the compressor during this displacement? Okay. Now, when he says gravity, he means weight. All right. Okay. So he gives you 25 kilograms. So the weight is simply divided, uh, multiplied by uh, 9.8, and you get the gravity, what he calls gravity. I don't like the term gravity. I like to call it weight. Way better than the word gravity. It should have been said, how much work does the weight of the compressor uh, does on the, uh, do, uh, during the displacement? Is that what I'm saying? Okay. Does the weight, I'm sorry, how much work does the weight of the compressor does uh, uh, <laughs> during this? I can't say it the right way, but anyway, you got the idea. All right. So how do we do this problem? Um, Let's write down what's given. So we are given R1 is equal to 
1.3i plus 1.3j j, uh, and then 2r2. So the displacement basically the, the difference between them, right? 8.3i plus 2.9j. It's right here. I'm, I'm looking at them right there. Okay. Uh, so the work done, so you want to find the work. And we know that work is equal to F dot R or delta R in this case. So delta R, the displacement is basically R2 minus R1. Okay. This is how you do it. So now we look at it. So it's 8.3i plus 2.9j minus 1.3i plus 1.3j. You got that? And then we calculate that. That becomes 7i plus 1.6j. That's the displacement, guys. Got it? There it is. Okay. So I'm ready for that. Now, what is f? We'll go back to the problem. How much work does gravity, which means the weight of the object. What is the weight of the object? Well, the mass of the object is 25 kilograms. So the weight would be what? 25 times 9.8. And because he said weight, weight is always downward, right? So downward, that means it's negative. So basically the weight here is going to be something like this minus mg as a vector or if you will you can write it this way minus mgj in the vertical direction how do i know j well, because he said so look uh did he say that there we go yeah where y is in the vertical axis there we go okay so that's the force right here so now we come back to the work so we have work is equal to F dot delta R. And by the way, maybe I forgot to mention, the dot product always produces a number. It never produces a vector. That's why you don't put a vector sign on the W because it's a number, scalar. Okay. So now we're ready to do it. So we have here minus MG J dotted with what delta R, which is 7I plus 1.6J. You see that? I'm going to plug in my numbers. So that's going to be minus 25 times 9.8J dotted with 7I plus 1.6J. As you know, uh, J dot I will give you zero, correct? So that's going to be ignored. So we're just going to take this dotted with 1.6J and that's it. That will be the answer. You see what I'm saying? So that will be minus 25 times 9.8 times 1.6 j dot j which is equal to one right so we end up with uh, if i calculate those numbers together the product of those numbers i'm going to get 300 and uh, 390 so that's negative 390 joule there's no j remember that j dot j is equal to what equals to one it's just a scalar it's just a number you see what i'm saying and the unit of this which is the unit of the work and that's equal to joules okay guys i hope this is clear okay okay good um let's do number 17 this is another uh dot product here There we go. It says a 45 gram bug. Oh, that's a big bug. 45 grams. 45 gram bug is hovering in the air. A gust of wind exerts a force F equals 4I minus 6J quantity times 10 to the negative 2 Newton on the bug. A, how much work 
is done by the wind as the bug undergoes displacement of delta r given to us okay simple problem right work equal f delta uh, dot delta r you just put it in there and you're done with the problem really part b uh what is the bug's speed at the end of the displacement so now once he mentions speed we're going to appeal to work energy display uh, excuse me energy theorem you know w equal delta k e okay anyway so let's do that Let me get it a little bit out so you can see uh, it's difficult to squeeze it in there. Oh, well. Okay. So what we have, let me write down what's given for us. He said the mass of the bug is 45 gram. I mean, that's a really heavy bug. I mean, uh, the, the mass of the penny is four grams. So that's about 10 times the mass of a penny. And how, what, what kind of bug is that? I don't know. It's almost like a bird. Anyway. So we have a 45 uh, gram bug. Uh, the force, the the wind, the gust, whatever you call it, is 4i minus 6j times 10 to the negative 2 newton. And delta r is saying is equal to 2i minus 2j. It's right there, guys, right there. Okay, meters. So the work here, he's asking for, let's go back to the problem. He says, how much work done is done by the wind on the bug? Remember, the wind is the one that's doing the force. So here we have F dot delta R. And we do exactly what we've done last time. So I have here 4I minus 6J times 10 to the negative 2 dot make a big dot there so your teacher will see it 2i minus 2j like that so what do you do i i j j so you you do 4i dot 2i negative 6j dot negative uh, 2j and then of course don't forget that 10, 10 to negative 2 so once you do that you'll end up with this I have it solved in my notes. I'm looking at it right now. Again, you can pause the video and do it yourself and and make sure that you got the answer that I am showing you right now. The final answer is 0.2j. There we go. And there we go. Okay, so the work done by the wind on the bug is 0.2 joule not much okay part b he says <clears throat> uh, what's the bug's speed at the end of its displacement assume the speed is this that the speed is due entirely to the wind all right the wind is the force remember so again we appeal to the uh to the work energy theorem now since let's go back to the problem uh a bug is hovering in the air now this is the beginning in the beginning the bug was hovering in the air what does that mean it means the initial velocity is zero it's just standing there it's hovering in the air i mean that's a big bug 45 gram but it's just hovering in the air so the initial velocity this is important information for us all right so here I have V naught is zero, and he is asking for really the final velocity. I know that the work is equal to delta K, delta K E that is, you know, the initial and the final minus initial. So that's one half M V squared minus one half M V naught squared, but V naught is zero, so that's just zero here. So basically W, is equal to one half m v squared. Do the solve for v. That'll give me two w over m under the square root like that. And I think we got everything. So I have here square root of two times the work, which is right there. So I have point two. 
0.2 divided by the mass of the bug, which is point, uh, what is that, 45 gram? Is it 0 0.00? Uh, I'm confused. 45 divided by 1,000. Point zero, sorry, point, excuse my math, point zero four five. And there we go. Uh, then I would plug in all of that in the calculator, and I will end up with three meters per second. So that's the final speed of a bug. When the wind blew it while it was hovering in the air. You got it? Okay, great. One more. I still have two more topics to talk about, uh, power and potential energy. Okay, problem number 18. It's right here, this picture right there, this one. Let me go over it very quickly. Uh, here it is. So you have a, it looks like a piano and uh, there are two cables, those are cable, cables for example. They are trying to lift the piano. This is the weight of the piano. And those two cables, one is exerting a tension of 1,830 uh, 1, Newton. The other one is exerting a tension of 1,295. This one is tension, is a tension is at uh, 60 degrees. The other one is 45 degrees. And the weight of the piano is 2,500 Newton. Got it? I mean, we've seen this kind of problem before in the past when we covered forces and equilibrium and all that. But now we want to calculate something how to do with work. I'm not sure what. Let's look at it. So he said, so looking at this figure, the two ropes seen, T1 and T2, are used to lower, uh -huh, to lowering, not lifting, to lower a 255 kilogram piano. Uh, five meters, so from here to there, okay? So five meters from the second story window to the ground. How much work is done by each of the three forces? Okay. Interesting. All right, so let's do it. This is kind of a, pay attention to this problem. It's not trivial. It's a typical engineering problem in mechanics. So we have okay. Let me let me draw it first. So I have a piano. It looks something like that. Those are the legs. Ah, bad legs. Okay, and then, uh, so we have two ropes like that. Tension 2 equals 1295 Newton, angle 45. Tension T1 equals 1830 Newton, angle 60 degrees. Then we got the MG. I like to call it MG. The book calls it F sub G. I hate that symbol. MG is kind of more explicit, simpler, because it's mass and G. Kind of a, everything is in front of me. He said the weight, the, excuse me, the mass of the thing is 255. Now, if I make it a weight, you're going to multiply by uh, 9.8. If I do that, I think you will get that 2,500. Let's see. 255 times 9.8. Answer. 2,499. So that's basically what it is. So this is equal to 2,500 Newton. And there we go. These are the three forces. And it's being lowered. This is very important. So it's coming from here and it's being lowered, uh, lowered to the ground floor. Here's the ground floor right here. And that distance is five meters. Is that what it says? Yeah, five meters right here. Five meters from the second window. All right, that's kind of a small building or whatever. Okay, there we go. Just to remind myself of being lowered. Okay, there we go. So how do we do it? Well, he says, look what he says. Look what, uh, he's not asking for the equation of motion or anything like that. 
how much work is done by each of the three. So I want to get the work done by the first, uh, for, uh, by T1, work done by T2, and work done by MG. That's what T1. That's it. Okay. How do we do it? Watch. Let's start with work done by the weight, MG. I'm going to call it W sub MG, okay? The MG here is a sub index. You remember, F is equal to what? Since these are, we can think of them like vectors or something like that, we can say F times delta Y, where delta Y is this one. Honestly, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it height H, you can call it D, you can call it delta R, you know, whatever. I, I just come up with the delta Y. It doesn't really matter, whatever notation you want to use. But because it's so long, the X axis is like, yeah, I'm just going to call it delta Y. Okay, so the force here, however, is the MG. So MG delta Y, there we go. I want to pay attention to, now I'm not done yet, before I put in the numbers, I don't want to get too excited. I need to get things correct here. What is the direction of MG? Down. What's the direction of the displacement? Down. Both positive, both in the same direction. Okay? That is work, and the work here is positive. Got it? They both have the same direction. So, in other words, I can just plug in the number. So mg here is going to be 2,500 times 5. Or if you really want to, hold on, hold on. I, I, want to, I want to do it right. I mean, what I've done is not wrong. I just want to show you something else. mg is minus, correct? So it's just going to go minus 2,500 times minus 5. And there we go. We're going to get a positive work. And when I calculate that, I'm going to get... Um, 1.25 times 10 to the fourth joule. I'll put it in scientific notation. There we go. This is the work done by MG. And it's a positive work. You'll understand what that means in a minute. Just bear with me. There we go. Got it so far? Okay. Let's do now work done. Again, keep that picture in mind. Maybe you want to put it in your notes. I'm going to make it disappear now. Whoops. So I have here work done by T1. Okay, again, go back to the picture. Here's T1 right here. Right here. Okay. Okay. Good. So what I have in here, what is the direction? Okay, T1, remember that the, um, T1 or the force must be parallel with the displacement. Remember that? Well, T1 is not parallel. The displacement is down. Here is the displacement right here. Displacement is down, and this one is not. But the component, the Y component of T1 is... Uh, the y component of t1 is parallel, so only we, so we're gonna take only the y the 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 the, the y component of t1, because that's the only one that is parallel with the displacement. The x component, which is this way, is not gonna do any work. Let me elaborate. No, put it in there. See, t1 here has two components: one this way, t1x, and then I have t1y. Correct. This is the one that is going to do, oops, I'm going to reach the edge here again. Now we go this way, T1Y. This is the one that is going to do the work because it is anti-parallel with, with the displacement. It's not necessarily parallel. This one going up, this one going down, but that's okay. It's still parallel. We call it anti-parallel, okay? But this one definitely is perpendicular to it, so it's not going to do any work, okay? So keep that in mind. This one is going to be positive work, excuse me, positive, uh, uh, I'm sorry, positive force up. This one negative, okay? 
So now when I plug in all of that in here, so the work done by T1 is going to be equal to, I could write it this way if you want, T dot delta Y as a vector. You don't need to do that if you don't want to, T1 here. All right, so that will be equal to uh, T, go back to the diagram, this one, T sine 60. Sixty degrees, and it's positive because it's going up. Times delta y, which is minus five. Yes. So here we have. Remember, five. Uh, the displacement is down, so we're going to end up with a negative work. That's okay. So t one here is uh, what is it? One eight three zero sine sixty is point eight six six times minus 5, and when I calculate that, I'm going to end up with negative 7.92 times 10 to the third joule, WT1. There we go. And as you can see, this is negative work. So this is positive work here for the, for the weight. This one, however, is negative work. Okay? All right, let's do the third one. Now, work done by T2. Let's go back to the picture. So the only component that will do the work is the y component of T2. The x component is not going to do anything, as we did here. Also, it's going to be negative because this is opposite of the displacement. So it's going to be a negative work. I hope you understand all that. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. So I'm going to have here work done by T2. It's going to look something like that. T2 dot, remember this is a dot, delta y. So I can go uh, T2 positive uh, sine 45. Look at the picture here as I uh, write all that stuff down. Dotted with, well, we're done with the dot. It, it, negative 5, right? And there we go. So I have here <clears throat> T2 is 1295. Sine 45 is 0.707 times minus 5, and this will give me um, 1, 2, 9, 5. That will give me negative 4.58 times 10 to the third joule. And that, again, is negative work. Is that the end of the problem? Let me see. Um, how much work is done by each of the three forces? Well, there they are. We just found them. Got it? Okay. Okay, I have uh, reached almost an hour and a half of uh, lecture. This is going to be part one. So I'm going to go with the. Uh, so when we are done with that, uh, when you're ready, you can click on the second lecture of this uh, same topic as part two. Okay? Bye-bye.